Hey Prodigal, we are so glad you joined us. We are in week two of our study of the most popular verse in the whole Bible, John 3.16. We don't know if you've heard, but next week is Super Bowl, which means for us, it's Super Sunday. We have an awesome day planned out, we have inflatables for the kids, we have a taco truck, and we even have a salsa competition. We also have two spots open for the competition, so if you got a killer recipe that you want everyone to try, sign up either after church or online. Our next baptism service is February 26th. If you're interested in getting baptized or you just have questions about what baptism is all about, message us on social media, send us an email, or ask any of the staff members. We are so excited for our Love the World auction coming up on Friday, March 3rd. It's gonna be a great night for us to come together as a church with our friends and families to raise money for more acts of justice, compassion, and love in our community and throughout the world. As we get ready for the event, we still need some help from you guys. You can get involved by volunteering on the day of the event, donating auction items, or purchasing tickets, which are on sale right now. If you wish to purchase tickets, go to the app or our website, click the auction tab. That's it for me in announcements today. If you want to stay up to date for what's going on in church, you can click the events tab in the app. Again, we thank you for joining us for week two of our series, John 316. Have a great Sunday. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side oh how long have i chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply cause in the highlands and the heartache Neither more or less inclined I would search and stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heart your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinners past and know oh, how fast would you come run if just a shadow me through the night trace my steps through all my failures Walk me out the other side To a terrace and that mountain A valley hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me So I will pray on the mountains and I will praise you in the mountains in my way you're the summit where my feet are so I will praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadows no less faithful when the night meets me astray you're the
stand If ever I walk through the valley of death oh, I'll sing through the shadows my song of the sand Wherever I walk through, wherever I am You name the move mountains wherever I stand If ever I walk through the valley of death I'll sing through the shadows my song of the sand, my song of the sand. turn with me to the most familiar passage in all the Bible. John, the third chapter, the Gospel according to John, the third chapter, and the sixth verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Classic. High five. High five. High five. High five. High five. humiliating than when you go for a high five and it's not reciprocated okay it's awful okay because you're reaching your hand out there expecting a return right no one reaches a hand out for a high five without at least a 95% confidence rate that the other hand is gonna meet you in the air and perhaps that's why it's so humiliating you're almost certain so you put that hand out in confidence only to be disappointed I'm a high fiver Okay, we have a staff member who is not a high fiver. Okay, not only are they not a high fiver, but they will stand strong and leave you hanging. Had I known this when I hired this person, they would not be employed today. Okay, I'll never forget the moment that I learned this awful fact about this employee. We were at a staff meeting and some, someone said something great. Okay, it was probably me. And I reached out my hand towards them and said, high five. And they just closed their lips and shook their head. Like, 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 as if I had like a spoonful of poison or some terrible food. I'm like, come on, try it. And they're, they just tightened their lips and shook their head. It made me feel disgusting, okay? I was sad, I was humiliated. It affected me, okay? I had this plethora of emotions all because they left me hanging. Now, today, we're going to be giving each other a corporate 
high five, okay? We're gonna read, memorize, and think through John 3.16 through the five fingers that create a high five. Are you ready? Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're ready, okay? Now keep your thumb up in the air because your thumb is the first part of this high five, okay? The thumb is this, for God so loved the world, okay? That's the thumbs up, for God so loved the world. Why? Why, because the, the thumb is the strongest, okay? It, it's what allows you to take hold of anything else. Likewise, for God so loved the world is the strongest line in John 3, 16. Okay, we spoke about this last week. For God so loves the world. You, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. It is this earth shattering reality that if we say it enough or if we hear it enough, if we think on it enough, we might never be the same. In the year of 2000, I spent the first six months in Malawi, Africa. I was 19 and I had some of the greatest times of my life, greatest memories ever there. I grew so much, I learned so much. But at times, it was very difficult. And on February 28th, I remember that date because I wrote it in my daily journal. On February 28th, the year 2000, just two months into my trip, I was sitting on a rock overlooking this beautiful small river. I was pouring my heart out to God. I had just read in the Bible how uh, God revealed his glory to Moses. And I asked God to show me his glory. Show me your glory the way you showed Moses. And then I felt the sun shine through the clouds. I felt its warmth on my face. I heard the baboons in the trees and the birds in the air, and the sound of water passing over rocks on the river. And I felt that still small voice of the divine saying, this is my glory. And I started to cry. And as I cried, I again looked up to the sky to see the cloud in the shape of a thumbs up, okay? Tears are rushing down my face and I, I give that thumbs up right back to God upstairs, the big guy. The God of the universe was present to me, was present with me, was concerned with me. God loved me. I'll never forget it. I actually, in my journal, I drew a picture of the cloud that I saw in the shape of a thumbs up. The thumb. For God so loved the world. Okay, that's first. And then uh, we've got the index finger, okay? That he gave his only son, okay? He gave. He gave. Have you ever given anything? It's yours, then you give it. You have it. And then you say, here, here. God the Father gave Jesus. He gave him. He said, here. God gave Jesus in his teaching ministry and life. God gave Jesus in suffering love on the cross. God gave Jesus in his triumph from the tomb on that first Easter Sunday. He gave his son here. I don't know why that word here just, just landed different this week. It just as, I, as I'm reflecting on this passage, just that simple word here. When you give of something and then you, and it goes to them. He gave his son here. His one and only son, okay? This is the index finger, right? His one and only son. Love gives. Love gives. Love gave his one and only son. I read this past week about an interview with an astronaut who walked on the moon. The interviewer asked, when you were on the moon and you were looking back at the earth or up at the earth or down at the earth, what was going through your mind? And he said, I was on the moon and there was one thought that I couldn't get out of my head. That I had come to the moon on a spacecraft that had been built by the lowest bidder on a government contract. And all of a sudden, I got frightened. The lowest bidder on a government contract. When God wanted to fix the world, when God looked upon the world from a much greater distance, he did not send the lowest bid. He paid the highest price. 
God gave his one and only son the truest way. He gave himself. He didn't do the bare minimum. He gave it all. He gave everything. A counselor was meeting with a married couple who was going through an extremely difficult time. The session was getting intense and it was getting worse and words were exchanged that were not healthy words. And the exasperated husband said, I've given you everything. I've given you a new home. I've given you a new car. I've given you jewelry. I've given you our children. And she paused and she said, you're right. You've given me everything but you. You didn't give me everything because you didn't give me yourself. God gave himself that whosoever believes in him. And that is the middle finger, okay? I won't show you the individual one there, but it's the middle finger, okay? It's right here, that whosoever believes in him. The middle finger is the thing that connects um, all five, okay? It's the one right in the middle. And there are three parts to this middle finger, okay? Whosoever believes in him, okay? Who is whosoever, okay? Whoever, whosoever. I saw uh, a place online that to be a member of this particular club, okay? You first had to pay $300,000 just to get in, and then another $150,000 a year to be a member of this extremely exclusive club. You had to have a certain income. You had to have a certain prestige. You had to have a certain reputation. Did you know that it is easier to get into heaven than it is a country club? You are the whosoever, okay? Look at the person next to you. Maybe you're driving, maybe you're running. You just point that car. That person is whosoever, okay? Whosoever is the person next to you. It's also the person looking at you in the mirror every day. You're the whosoever. And the second part of this stanza is believes, okay? A better translation would be believes, okay? I know that that's not a word. But so often when we think of belief, we think of intellectual knowledge, okay? We believe something up here. That's not what John's talking about, okay? Have you ever noticed that there are some people you enjoy driving in a car with and others not so much? Now, for the most part, I'm lucky because I love driving with Sarah. But occasionally, we have our tiffs, okay? And I'm usually the guilty one. Have you ever said something, and even before you say it, you realize this is not going to land well, okay? I shouldn't have said it. Okay, we're driving. I missed the turn lane. Sarah's sitting shotgun, and she says, isn't that the turn lane right there? And I respond, isn't that the passenger seat right there? Okay, and as those words left my mouth, I was like, no, 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 don't feel bad for her. Okay, because when we got home, she said, isn't that the couch right there? Are there people in your life that they're not the greatest to drive with? Okay, one person that isn't the easiest to drive with is my dad. Okay, years ago, when I was back in my 20s or maybe even the early 30s, I drove with my parents to Las Vegas. Okay? It's about a five and a half, six hour drive. And from Vegas, we were going to fly to Illinois to visit family. And being the good son that I was, I was like, Dad, you can drive if you want. No big deal. But being the good dad that he is, he said, no, it's okay, son. You can, you can drive. And when you're, when you're the adult, when, when a kid becomes an adult, I think it's hard for parents to, to see them as an adult, like almost as a peer, okay? And the anxiety that my dad experienced in the passenger seat, it made me sweat, okay? I followed too closely. I was going too fast. I was going too slow. He's like, why are you listening to Taylor Swift the whole drive? It wasn't an easy drive for me. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't an easy drive for him. In his truck, he wanted me to drive. In his head, He wanted me to drive. In his heart, he was still driving. To believe in Jesus, it's to do all three. In your life, in your mind, in your heart. He takes, Jesus take the, Carrie Underwood was right, okay? Jesus take the wheel. 
a man once bought one of Whistler's famous paintings. And he asked the great artist to help him find the right place for it in his home. And the artist agreed to help. And he walked patiently from place to place in the man's room while the man held up the picture in various locations throughout the entire house. And finally, Whistler said, you are going about this all wrong. What you need to do is move all the furniture out, hang the picture where you want it, and then arrange all of the furniture in relation to the picture. This morning, today, this afternoon, Jesus is giving us a similar message. He doesn't want to be added to what you already have. He wants to be first. And if you let him come in, he'll help you arrange all the rest so that you can experience the joy of having the greatest treasure on earth. To believe, to believe is to rearrange it all around Jesus. And then the last part of this middle finger, okay, the whosoever believes in him, in him, in Jesus, okay? Mary's baby, the Prince of Peace, the Lamb of God, the Light of the World, the Mighty Savior, the Bread of Life, the Son of God, the Promised Messiah, the Lion of Judah, the Morning Star, God's Beloved Son, the Friend of Sinners. It is whoever believes in Him. It's all about Jesus. A father was reading a newspaper while his son was competing for his attention. Nothing the dad said seemed to keep the boy away. And so finally, the dad noticed a large ad on the newspaper showing a picture of the earth. Thinking to divert his son's attention, he cut the picture out and he made it into a puzzle. And then he challenged him to put the world back together again on this breakfast table. In no time at all, the boy returned with the world put back together. When his father asked him how he accomplished this so quickly, the boy responded, it was easy. On the back was a picture of a man. And when I put the man together, the world came together by itself. If we get Jesus right, our worldview and our view of others become so much more clear. And it frees us up for relationships. The fourth finger is shall not perish, okay? This, this part, this is the fourth finger, okay? The ring finger. Because whenever you speak of judgment and consequences, it's awkward. And when you hold up four fingers, it's so awkward to keep the thumb up while holding the four fingers, right? Like the pinky's like, like I, I want in on this too. And so the easiest way to show four fingers would be to tuck the thumb away, right? It's hard to keep the thumb as a part of the game, okay? He looks different. He's off to the side. He looks different than all the others. Poor thumb, okay? It's so much easier to just close the thumb and hold up the four fingers rather than put the pinky finger down and hold up four, right? But when you do this, you lose the thumb. When you, when you tuck the thumb, you lose it. It disappears. It's hidden. And do you remember what the thumb was? Remember the thumbs up? For God so loved the world. And that is the temptation when we speak of perishing, when we speak of judgment, when we speak of consequences. It's so easy to lose God's love for the world. And we mustn't do this. It seems like street preachers and televangelists today love the part about people perishing. They focus on the fourth finger and then they lose the thumb. They focus on the judgment and they lose the love. The Greek word here for perish is apolumi, to put out of the way entirely, to abolish, to put an end or to ruin, to render useless, to declare that one must be put to death, to perish, to be lost, to be ruined, to be destroyed, to lose. Whoever believes in him shall not lose. Whoever believes in him shall not be ruined. Whoever believes in him shall not be abolished. Whoever believes in him shall not be lost. This perishing instills a fear within all of us. Jack Nicholson is a, a wealthy older man in this movie called The Bucket List, right? And he's coping with his impending death 
and the death of a friend. And he says in the movie, we all want to go on forever, don't we? We fear the unknown. Everybody goes to that wall, yet we don't know what's on the other side. That's why we fear death. You don't need to fear death. You don't need to fear being lost. You don't need to fear the consequences because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. There is this story told out of ancient Persia about a general who had the strange custom of giving criminals a choice between death or the big black door. And as the moment of execution draws near, spies were brought before the Persian general who asked the question, what will it be, death or the big black door? One spy faced with this dilemma hesitated for a long time, and it was a difficult choice, but he chose death. Moments later, shots rang out, confirming his execution. The general turned to his aide and said, they always prefer the known way to the unknown. It's characteristic of people to be afraid of the undefined, yet we give them a choice. And the eight said, what lies beyond the big black door? Freedom, replied the general. I've only known a few brave enough to take it. The present is terrifying. It is easy to live in the past and it is easy to dream away the future. It's a real challenge to face the present because it means that we no longer allow ourselves the luxury of saying, one of these days, I'll do something about my temper. One of these days, I'll do something about my addiction. One of these days, I'll do something about the unforgiveness that I've been harboring for years. One of these days, I'll do something about my commitment to God. It is in the present that matters. And it's terrifying. And finally, shall have everlasting life. Okay. High five. Did you know that everlasting life or eternal life was a Jewish way of speaking of a kind of life that lasts? It's also translated life of the ages. For far too long, we have made it about heaven when we die, that we begin to miss the reality of heaven here and now. In language, it's important. Sometimes words combined can have a greater or different meaning than each word's individual meaning. For example, the phrase chill out, it doesn't mean go outside and be cold, okay? Similarly, eternal life meant more to the Jewish audience than simply my heart will go on. Okay. Rather, the ancient Jews would have understood eternal life as life in the world to come or life in the age to come. That's the new heaven and the new earth where God will rule without any disobedience, where sin's not going to get in the way, and there is no injustice, hatred, lying, violence, or darkness. The world to come is God's new world order. And that would have been the first thing that the Jewish people would have heard when they heard the phrase eternal life. The emphasis, therefore, is not on the length of life, how long you will live, but the kind of life, how you live. Not based on the order of this world, but the order of God's new world. Of course, this includes living forever, since God's new heaven and new earth will triumph over physical death. But to reduce eternal life to be only a physical reality in the sweet hereafter is to lose the original breath in translation. Jesus defined eternal life as knowing God. John 17, the same author, just several chapters down. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Notice that Jesus did not say that knowing God is the way of gaining eternal life. Rather, he said that to know God is eternal life. It's something that starts here and now. The, this relationship with God is not only reserved for life after death, it's reserved for life before death. Eternal life begins already in present day when we love God and we follow his ways and we seek his kingdom and his righteousness so that 
the life in the world to come becomes a reality in us. And all of that rich meaning would not make sense if when we read eternal life, we only think of it as living forever in heaven. But heaven is a reality. When this life is over, it isn't over. This isn't all there is. And those we have lost before, we will one day be reunited. And it's because of Jesus. I don't know what heaven will be like. I once heard a pastor say in describing heaven, it will be unlike anything we can comprehend, like a church service that goes on forever. Um, that sounds a bit more like hell, okay? okay? We're just gonna worship Jesus for millions and millions of years. Millions and millions of years? Could we just like stop every now and then, like mess around, like play a game or something? Okay, I don't know what heaven will be like, but I know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what baptism is? Baptism's a high five. It's the, it's the public proclamation of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When Winston Churchill died, he had two requests at his funeral. They were to play the song, Taps. Okay, you're familiar. Taps is, the day is over. And then immediately following, just when the last note has ended from the song, they were then to play the song, Reveille. Right? Reveille, it's time to get up. A new morning has arrived. This is our future in Jesus. It is not the end, but the beginning. We are not leaving the land of the living to the land of the dying. We are leaving the land of the dying into the land of the living. Jesus, pray that John 3.16 forms our hearts, that we dwell on the powerful statement of your love for the world, and that that changes us. We thank you that in you we have everlasting life, ion zoe, life of the ages. God, help us to not just focus on then, but also to help bring heaven here and now. In Jesus' name, amen. We wanna thank you so much for joining us online at Prodigal Church Fresno. Uh, we consider you a part of our church. Uh, and next week, if you are in Central California at all, would you make the trek here for Super Sunday? It's going to be an absolutely incredible, incredible time. Um, and we got all you need to get ready for the big game. Uh, and then secondly, in several weeks, we have our auction. We just want to remind you that even if you are online and you want to be a part of helping raise money um, to make a difference for God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, in southeastern Africa and here in the Central Valley, uh, you can do so at prodigalchurchpresidentcom slash auction. There you can buy tickets, um, sponsor a table, sponsor the event, or donate live silent auctions. We want to encourage you to check that out because that is a great way to fund uh, the ministry here at Prodigal and overseas. We hope you have an amazing week. Grace and peace in Ukraine.